Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight, two Victorian ghost stories that are on the shorter side. The Red Woolen Necktie by Bithia Mary Croker and The Seaweed Room by Clarice Irene Klingen. The Red Woolen Necktie When this century had reached the age allotted to man, and I was but yet in my teens, we lived in a rambling old place in the west called Kulnafen. My father, Colonel Mardall, succeeded to this property at a truly propitious moment, for just as he was kicked out of the service for age, another career opened its arms to him, one almost as exciting and uncertain, in short, the career of an Irish landlord. We found Coolnathan in surprisingly good repair, surrounded by a fine, well-timbered demesne, and, imposing as it was isolated, the house stood at the junction of the back and front avenues, which were each about a mile in length. We were four miles from church, ten from our post town, and fifteen from a station. Neighbors were few and far between, but we were a host in ourselves, seven motherless boys and girls, and the roomy old mansion, great walled gardens, orchards and grounds, proved a delightful change from barrack quarters and the narrow limits of the conventional furnished house of a garrison town. The experience that I am about to relate occurred when I was nineteen, that is to say, when chinons and croquet were the fashion. In spite of my years, I was credited with an old head on young shoulders, and was the mistress of my father's establishment, and keeper of the keys. No easy post, considering that I had to deal with six boisterous and critical young relatives. I shared the same room with my sister Fanny. It was the best bedroom, a great lofty apartment with three bow windows. One hot July night, I could not sleep for ages. I tumbled and tossed. I got up and drank water. I counted the prescribed hundred sleep. I watched the moonlight steal in between the blinds and touch each separate object on which it fell with a weird, pale light. I felt cold, shivering, frightened. But why? I did not believe in ghosts. I was not alone, for there was Fanny in an opposite bed, breathing regularly, and evidently far away in the land of dreams. What ailed me? Why was I conscious of a beating heart, accompanied by a scarcely defined but undeniable dread? At last I fell off, and I dreamt. Though all the time... Even in my dream, I said to myself, this is not a dream, it is real. It seemed as if the house, for some unexplained reason, was empty. I was absolutely alone, sitting reading in the drawing room with my back to one of the long French windows which opened to the ground. Suddenly a dark shadow came between me and the light, and, turning around, I beheld a tall, powerful man with his head pressed closely against the glass. His face was shaded by a weather-beaten wide awake, or cobbin. He was dressed like a tramp, and the only thing I particularly noticed about him was a pair of very large, dirty hands and a red worsted necktie. He remained for some seconds leaning against the sash and gazing intently into the room. Then I started to my feet and called out, What do you want? Is the colonel within? he asked in a hoarse voice. No, he is out, I screamed in reply. I want to see him badly. I served under him once. Is Master Robin or Master Ted in? I shook my head. I've come a terrible long way, holding up a large foot in a dusty broken shoe, and I'm dying on my feet with hunger and the weakness. Wait then, I cried, on a sudden impulse. Go round to the front entrance. I hurried into the hall, intent on benevolence and broken victuals, and flung the door wide open. Quick as I had been, the tramp was already on the steps. "'Are they all out, miss?' he panted, in a husky voice. "'All,' I replied, and I was about to add, except myself, but before I could utter another syllable he had sprung at me, seized me by the throat with brutal ferocity, and pressing me hard against a stone pillar, he proceeded to strangle me. I could not move, struggle, or scream. I felt his foul breath on my face, his savage, wolfish eyes fastened on mine. Everything was becoming black, the world reeled, a strange sound of the sea roared in my ears. I was suffocating, dying, dead. No, for here I awoke and found myself sitting up and shrieking, shrieking like a maniac. I saw Fanny jump out of bed by the light of a pale summer night and come running over to me. She held me tightly while I gasped and panted, precisely as if I had been really choked. 
Meantime, all my relatives, in all sorts of costumes, poured into the room, believing, not unnaturally, that murder was being done. Presently I recovered my voice, and in faint, broken sentences, stammered out my tragic tale, which same tale was received with angry derision by father, and yells of laughter by my kindred. Robin, my eldest brother, who had been the first to arrive upon the scene, armed with an ancient horse pistol, was particularly indignant. If you are taken like this again, sis, you will have to sleep in the far greenhouse, or in the backyard. Your yells sounded for all the world like a pig being killed. Then, with as much dignity as was compatible with a pair of long bare legs and a short military cape, he made his exit. When all the kind inquiries had departed, I flung myself into Fanny's sympathetic arms, and enjoyed a thoroughly luxurious cry, and sobbed myself to sleep. Sissy's friend with the red tie, and Sissy's dream, became a sort of family joke and a byword with the boys for many, many months. At last other events thrust the jest into the background, and it was eventually forgotten, even by myself, though for weeks and weeks at night I had seemed to feel an iron grip upon my throat, and to meet in the dark the intolerable glare of a pair of wolfish eyes. Two whole years had passed since I experienced that hideous vision. Robin was in India with his regiment. Fanny was in Switzerland on her honeymoon. We were quite a small party at home now, only five. It was a lovely day in the month of September. Father and every one of the family, also the servants, and almost every soul about the place, had departed at daybreak for the great annual fair, held at our nearest town. They had set out at three o'clock, and were not expected home until dark. Father had horses to sell and cattle to buy, and each of the domestics required something, for besides a market for multitudes of sheep and oxen, this fair boasted of merry-go-rounds, shows, and booths. No one remained, save the cook, who might reasonably have been exhibited as the fat woman, Scanlon the butler, and myself. Scanlon was an ancient retainer, formerly father's soldier servant, an old bachelor with a close fist and a crusty temper who still insisted on treating me as if I were but six years of age. I spent the long hours busily. I had presided at breakfast by candlelight. It was not often I had a day to myself totally undisturbed, and I made the most of it. I wrote letters, mended garments, rearranged the smoking room, a daring liberty, made two family cakes, and gathered and arranged a quantity of flowers. Then I prepared to enjoy a well-earned rest, and Oliver Twist. I drew my chair into a French window in the drawing room, and sat with my back to the light, thrilled by the murder of poor Nancy. My nerves were strung to their highest tension as I followed the awful career of Bill Sykes. My silly little heart was beating tumultuously, a mere mouse in the wainscot had actually made me jump. Judge, then, of my feelings, when suddenly a black shadow fell across the page, and turning, I beheld the man of my dream, red necktie and all. Yes, there he was, and no, I was not asleep. I was wide awake. His hulking body leant heavily upon the sash, his frowsy hat was pulled over his eyes, while his great hands fumbled awkwardly for the handle of the window. I fastened the bolt precipitately, glanced quickly at the other windows. Thank God they were all closed. I then screamed out, What do you want? Is the colonel within? No, he is out. I want to see him badly. I served under him. Wait, I cried. Then I darted across the room. I tore at the bell. How it clanged and reverberated through the empty lower regions. I held the door ajar and saw, as it were, unconsciously, a gaunt, slouching figure pass to the front at a shambling run. Scanlon's well-drilled military step was, oh, what a sweet sound to me. I spoke to him, still holding the door, ready to fly at an instant's notice. There is a dreadful-looking man about, a tramp. Put the chain on the hall door and don't let him in, I cried out hysterically. All right, miss, replied Scanlon, departing with loud, leisurely footsteps. I heard him put up the chain and open the door with his usual flourish. Presently he closed it, and came back, saying very peevishly, There's not a soul there, Miss Sissy. You were up early, and you fell asleep without doubt, and you dreamed it. No, not this time, was my enigmatic answer. I expect he is hidden in the laurels. Keep the door locked and barred, for heaven's sake. And Scanlon, in my most coaxing key, If you don't mind, 
Would you sit in the hall till they come back? I, I feel dreadfully nervous. Scanlon had no sympathy with nerves. Nevertheless, he remained within call, biding in the dining room and library. They, meaning the family and servants, returned about eight o'clock, all full of their day's doings and in the highest spirits. They discoursed volubly of their bargains in colts, yearlings, calves, ribbons, shawls, and even gingerbread husbands. "'And you, of course, saw no one. You stick at home, sis,' said my brother Ted. "'You have nothing to tell us?' "'You are mistaken for once,' I answered, tremulously. "'The tramp I dreamt about called. The man with the yellow necktie. "'Well, that is news. Did he leave his card for me?' I did not go receive him this time, as you may imagine, I continued, with ill-assumed composure. I called Scanlon, and when he opened the front door, there was no one to be seen. You don't say so, cried Teddy, sarcastically. I should have been rather surprised if there was. You were dreaming again. How does old Pipe Day like attending on your visionary callers? I thought he looked rather black. But it was no dream this time, I repeated. I saw the tramp as plainly as I see you. The dream was a warning and saved my life. Saved your grandmother? Upon my word, sissy, it is getting serious, you and your visitor with the red tie. And he roared with laughter, as rudely as any brother in Great Britain. Nevertheless, the next morning, he and everyone looked grave enough, when the news was brought by Pat, the postboy, that old Pat and Mrs. Kelly, who lived at that lonely spot, the back lodge, and were credited with considerable savings, had been found with their house pillaged and their throats cut. Their spoons, watch, and money had been carried off, although the poor old couple had evidently made a desperate struggle for their lives and property. The furniture was upset, and the walls splashed with blood. However, the only clue to the murderer's identity was part of a red woolen necktie found in the dead woman's rigid clutch. The other half was subsequently picked up in the wood, but the tramp, its owner, was never seen again. No, not even in my dreams. The End The Seaweed Room This is the seaweed room, announced the housekeeper, putting a key into the lock. It has been shut up for a long time and will be a bit musty. With this she threw open the stout oaken door, and we entered a square apartment, darkened by closed shutters, and heavy with a strong, pungent odor. As our guide raised a window and opened the blinds, there was a rustling all about us as of the flight of pigeons. This was caused by the fluttering of quantities of dry seaweed, which were festooned upon the walls and over the doors and windows. "'That's nothing but common seaweed,' said the good woman, noticing our interested glances. "'It's used only as an ornament and to give character to the room. All the choice varieties are in these glass cases,' and pressed in this pile of scrapbooks with notes and explanations under them. Did Professor Linwood collect these specimens himself? I asked. I suppose so. He used to go on long voyages to the tropics and come home laden with new varieties, and then he'd spend months classifying and arranging them. He was a diver in his younger days, and after that made contracts for lifting sunken vessels or exploring old hulks that had money or merchandise on board. He'd put on his diving suit and go down with his men, I've heard tell, and many's the strange adventure he's had in ships at the bottom of the sea, so he told me one day when he felt chatty. That's how he first took to collecting seaweeds. He ransacked the bottom of the sea to get specimens, but after his marriage he never seemed to care for it any more. But perhaps all this don't interest you. It's the seaweed you want. You can examine it as much as you like. We did so and lingered long, held by the charm of this strange room that was redolent with the mysteries of the great deep. We sat on a couch, talking in low tones and listening to the rustling seaweeds over our heads, our feet resting on some of the same material, which had been fashioned into a rude mat that covered the floor and also the divan on which we were seated. The whole apartment was full of it in all forms and phases. A wreath of it surrounded the only portrait in the room, that of a young girl with frank, pleasing eyes and a sweet mouth. The housekeeper who had excused herself for a few moments, now returned with tea and biscuits. As she poured the fragrant beverage into little fat cups, we ventured to inquire who the original of the picture was. Mrs. Linwood, the professor's wife, replied the woman, giving a quick, apprehensive look at it over her shoulder. 
Then, replied my companion, it's no wonder the professor took no more voyages after his marriage. I said he collected no more seaweed, sir, responded the housekeeper. He made one voyage directly after his marriage and took his bride with him. The vessel was wrecked in a terrible storm, and only a few of the passengers were saved. Mrs. Linwood was among the lost. That was an odd coincidence, that she should be lost and he be saved, I said, half questioningly. Well, sir, that leads up to the most peculiar story you ever heard. As long as the professor lived, I never dared breathe it. But now he's gone, I might relate a strange circumstance in connection with this room. We encouraged her so much that the good woman began immediately. It was not until the professor was nearly sixty that he thought of taking a wife. Then he was very foolish, if I may be allowed to say it, for he fell in love with a little girl only eighteen, and he being rich, her parents favored the match, though she was much attached to a second cousin of hers, a young fellow in an importing house, poor, but with good prospects, and, as luck would have it, this cousin was on the same steamer that took the professor and his bride to China, he going there on business for his firm. It must have been hard for the two poor young things to be doomed to such a long voyage, under such circumstances, especially as the professor was in an intensely jealous disposition, and forbade his wife to speak to her cousin. But, as I have said, the vessel ran aground in a storm and sank almost immediately. Mrs. Linwood was drowned, and her husband came back a changed man, broken in mind and body. He had even lost his interest in his particular fad, and I have seen him shudder at the sight of a piece of seaweed. He locked up this room, and I never saw him enter it again, except on one notable occasion. What was that? inquired my companion. Well, you see, not having his scientific studies to take up his mind, the old man became very lonesome and morbid. He never wanted to be alone, and must needs to have a house full of company the whole time. This was easy, for he had a great many nephews and nieces, and they, with their friends, kept us in a state of commotion, especially during the holidays and in summer vacations. One Christmas Eve, his favorite nephew, Jack Newton, came late in the evening, and to save my soul I didn't know where to put him to sleep. He was a merry, rollicking lad of seventeen, and he said he'd sleep in the attic, anywhere so that he got a chance at the dinner next day, always thinking of his stomach like any healthy boy. The attic was out of the question. Suddenly a thought came to me, and I asked him if he'd mind sleeping in the seaweed room. Just the thing, awfully jolly, said the boy, giving me a squeeze that nearly broke my neck. Then not a word to your uncle, I said, as soon as I could speak. Mum's the word, said the boy with a wink. So I fixed him a bunk on this here couch we're a sitting on, and, as it was bitter cold, started a bit of fire in the grate. Then I locked him in and carried away the key, so if by some strange chance the professor should stray up here late in the evening, he would find the key gone, and probably think it had been mislaid, for it usually hung on a nail beside the door. If I'd known the queer tricks of this room then as I do now, I'd never have locked the boy in. What happened during the night I got straight from Jack himself. It seems he went straight to sleep, and never woke till the faintest bit of daylight was stealing into his window. Then he was aroused, poor chap, by a low murmur of voices, and sitting up he saw on the hearth two figures talking together, one a girl with long black hair, and the other a young man who held her hands and was bending his face down to hers. Both of them was dripping wet, and he could hear the trickle of water as it fell on the big stone hearth they were standing on. Their faces were turned from him, but in the girl's hair was tangled a quantity of seaweed. Did I tell you Jack was a plucky little fellow? He was to the backbone. He said to himself that what he saw was an optical delusion, I believe he called it, that there was nobody but himself in the room. There couldn't be, because the door was locked. What do you want? Who are you? He cried, and with that jumped out of bed and came straight towards the two figures. As he advanced, they retreated towards the window, and when he reached the window, there wasn't anything there, though the window was shut except for a little space at the top. Well, Jack went back to bed and lay thinking it over for an hour, then fell asleep again. He was perfectly healthy, Jack was, and hadn't much idea of the supernatural. But now comes the strange part of it, for as he was dressing the next morning, what did the boy find but a pool of salt water on the stone hearth, and in that little hollow you can see from here that it has been worn in it, and lying in it a bit of fresh seaweed, in which was tangled a long black hair. Then, as Jack told me, 
His own hair began to rise in good earnest, and he was scared. So that morning after breakfast, he takes that bed of seaweed to his uncle and asks him if he'd ever seen any like it. The professor looked at the piece of wet weed, and his color went like the going out of a lighted taper. It's an uncommon variety, he said, and it's never found except on the bodies of drowned people. Where did you get it, Jack? And he looked at the boy wild-like, for I was a-watching of him from the passageway. I found it in my room, blurted out the boy. There was a couple of people in there last night, uncle, dripping wet. What do you mean? gasped his uncle, looking at him strangely. Come and I'll show you, he says, in spite of the fact that I was shaking my fist at him from the hallway. So together they went up to the seaweed room, I following to explain why I had taken the liberty to lodge Jack there. But the professor never noticed me. He followed Jack into the room, white to the lips, and kneeling down, examined the little pool of water on the hearth. It's seawater, he whispered, after a moment. What did you see, boy? Tell me everything. There's nothing much to tell, uncle, went on Jack, in his straightforward way. The girl's hair was down her back all wet, and full of seaweed. And see, here's a long black hair in the seaweed I found. The professor looked, then gave a cry such as I hope never to hear again, and fell back on the floor unconscious. He came back to life, but was never well after it, and he died six weeks afterward. Before he went he became communicative, and the secret of his wife's death came out. He and his wife were in a small boat, the last to leave the sinking vessel, together with a few other passengers and one sailor. The professor, being a man of authority and a well-known seaman, was in charge of the boat. Just as they were pushing off, they saw a figure clinging to the mast just above the water. It was Mrs. Linwood's cousin and former lover. At this she cried to her husband to put back to the ship and rescue him, and took on so at his danger that the demon of jealousy entered the husband's soul, and he swore that it would be impossible to go back, and that to take another person into the boat would sink it. At that moment the mast disappeared, and as it did the young man sprang into the sea, waving farewell to his cousin. Then, with one look at the professor that he never forgot to his dying day, she, too, jumped overboard and probably sank immediately. At least the body could not be recovered. Yes, it was a strange thing, those two coming back, if it was them, to this room. Those who have book learning can make it clear, perhaps, but I'm only an ignorant old woman and don't understand these deep things. I can only tell it to you just as it happened. The End